way back some time ago, we left the historical development of the nature of atoms at the point where Rutherford had managed to figure out what the structure, the physical structure of atoms would be um, according to his scattering experiment. And if you remember, uh, it had a very small, very massive nucleus surrounded by a bunch of uh, space that was occupied only by these very light electrons. And uh, that was called the nuclear model of the atom. Now, that was not the end of the story. We still, in chemistry, we look at atoms in terms of protons and neutrons and electrons. We do. Uh, but we do not use Rutherford's model to describe them. We use the quantum theory to describe them. So um, Rutherford's model to look at it in slightly greater detail, uh, had intrinsically um, held within it the idea that something must stop the negative electrons from just going down and hitting the nucleus. After all, they're attracted by Coulomb's law, right? Their charges attract one another. And so the idea was that maybe the electrons moved in some sort of a pseudo-orbit. And by moving, uh, they could uh, balance the charge. Basically, the kinetic energy of the electron's motion would have to balance out the potential energy of the attraction of negative and positive charges. OK. Well, that's all right for planets. But um, it does not address the general question of why the electron couldn't move a little closer and become more stable. Coulomb's law says if you bring two opposite charges closer together, what happens? The whole system is stabilized a little bit. Okay, And so the question is, why doesn't the electron continuously spiral down until it runs into the nucleus and the atom self-destructs? People are... are actively looking for atoms that self-destruct. And to my knowledge, at least, and I think it would make big headlines if anybody found one, no one has found any atoms that self-destruct except radioactive ones. Normal atoms don't self-destruct. So there's something wrong with Rutherford's model at this point, right? And you know what happens when a model is found to be inaccurate. You either have to modify it, or you have to replace it. And um, nobody could find a way to modify it that um, was plausible. And therefore, people started to look for a new way to describe atoms. And the development of theories is almost always accompanied by or preceded by the development of experimental information. New experimental information leads uh, to new ways to think about things, and maybe if you have new ways to think about something, you have uh, the ability to propose a new model to describe it. Okay? So how are they going to find information about atoms? They're too small to get in the tweezer. Uh, they're, they're very difficult to deal with in, on an individual basis, but it was known that atoms under the right circumstances emit electromagnetic radiation. Case in point, suppose you went to a place to have a particular type of beverage. And in the window of that particular place, there was a neon sign that said Budweiser or something like that. Okay, What is that sign? It's a neon sign. And it works by somebody making a long tube, pumping it out, pumping the air out of it, letting neon in, sealing it off, and having two metallic electrodes in it, attaching those to about 2,000 volts, and the whole thing lights up. What's happening? Electrical energy is being consumed, and it is causing the neon atoms to become excited 
And when the neon atoms go from their higher energy excited state down to the ground state, that energy they absorbed in doing so comes out as, in the case of neon, orange light. It's not too different from this red-orange thing on the stairs here. But you've all seen it. And you've seen different color ones. You put, instead of neon in, you put xenon in, you get a different color. If you put hydrogen in, you get a pinkish blue color. Um, so atoms, under the right circumstances, release electromagnetic radiation. So maybe that would be a good way to study atoms. And Maxwell and a number of other physicists had already uh, developed a framework for describing the properties of electromagnetic radiation. And electromagnetic waves were viewed as originating from the source, like the filament in a light bulb or some other source of light, uh, Budweiser sign. Uh, and the reason for the emission of these electromagnetic waves was uh, viewed to be the movement of electrical charges. Okay, different kinds of electrical charges. And such movement generates electrical fields. Uh, I've got a, just a very short little video here. Let's see what happens. Here we have the light bulb. Maxwell's going to tell us. Visible light is a form of electromagnetic radiation, which emanates from the source as waves. The waves are electric and magnetic fields oriented perpendicular to each other. Okay, so you can imagine a wave train coming out of the light bulb and it is electromagnetic, meaning there is an electric field in one plane and a magnetic field in the other plane. You can think of this as sort of uh, two sine waves that are locked together and they're moving out of the filament towards you and in fact in, in all directions. Uh, it was thought at various times that waves of the electromagnetic spectrum needed a medium to flow in, like water waves have water to flow in, and uh, uh, sound waves have air or some other gas to flow in. But it was finally proved that electromagnetic waves will travel very nicely through the vacuum of space, and they don't need any medium. Uh, and so, uh, all we need to do is to study the properties of the, uh, of the light, uh, of the radiation. It might consist of light, like it does here, but it could be radio waves or radar, microwave, all kinds of different things. And it has three characteristics that are worth us looking at. The wavelength, the frequency, and the amplitude. First, let's look at the frequency. The frequency is given the symbol Greek nu here. And if we look at the wave trains, we have three wave trains here. Uh, if the width of the wave train, or the, I'm sorry, the length of the wave train here is one second as the wave train moves along, uh, then uh, you could see here that in this top one, the wave goes through one, two, three, four cycles during one second. So we would say that this uh, electromagnetic radiation has a frequency of four cycles per second, or four per second, or uh, after Werner Hertz, uh, four hertz. Okay. Now the wavelength is the distance between two adjacent equivalent points, like two peaks, two valleys, troughs, or whatever you'd like to call them. The wavelength is a physical distance, and usually it's expressed in meters, but other things are possible as well. So the wavelength is the distance between any point on a wave and the corresponding point on the next wave or the, the wave before. Now, uh, the wavelength and the frequency are inversely related to one another. Because if we go down to the second line here, you could see this still one second is being uh, uh, occupied here, if you will. But now there are eight 
cycles that are that occurred during that one second and because of that the wavelength is smaller the distance between the equivalent points is roughly half what it was up here so there is an inverse relationship between the wavelength and the frequency which is inherent in what kind of stuff electromagnetic radiation is. Now, if you think about this, all electromagnetic radiation in a vacuum travels at the same speed. And you've heard that if you took physics or physical science. That speed is called C, the speed of light. And it's the same for electromagnetic radiation of all wavelengths and all frequencies. Uh, now, if you express the uh, speed of the wave train by multiplying the wavelength in meters times the frequency in seconds, this will give you uh, meters, uh, the speed in meters per second. A simple idea. The wavelength in meters times the frequency uh, in reciprocal seconds gives you the speed of the uh, transmission of the light or propagation of the electromagnetic radiation in meters per second. In a vacuum, that's a universal constant of 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second to three significant figures, and it's called generically the speed of light. Now, uh, the electromagnetic spectrum uh, encompasses a whole lot more than what your and my eyes can see. There is um, uh, a possibility of electromagnetic radiation wavelength that goes from uh, something over kilometers in length down to something incredibly small, that's comparable to the size of an atom. Now, the first thing you need to do from to learn from this lecture is the regions of the electromagnetic spectrum. Okay, this is the electromagnetic spectrum arranged with wavelength in nanometers increasing from left to right or frequency in reciprocal seconds increasing uh, from right to left. Okay, now how are you going to learn this? Gamma rays, x-rays, ultraviolet, visible, infrared, microwave, radio. Well, I'll tell you what my high school teacher told me. She said, Gene Angel, remember the name of that famous rock star, Gixu Vimmer. Okay. Gamma, X-ray, ultraviolet, Gixu, visible, infrared, microwave, radio, Vimmer. Gixu Vimmer. So now you got that, right? You won't, not a one of you will, will forget Gixu Vimmer, I am quite sure. Uh, now the visible range is in here. You could see this little bitty visible range. And evidently, if you, uh, if you think about evolution, this range must have given us, or given uh, human organisms, some kind of benefit because there are other organisms that can see in the ultraviolet, and some that can see in the infrared, but we can't really see in either of them, uh, and yet somehow we get by. What we can see is the visible range of the electromagnetic spectrum, which runs roughly from 400, which is down in the blue-violet, up to 750, which is up towards the red region. And uh, this visible region, there's nothing at all special about it except that the mechanism for perception that exists, color perception that exists in our eye, turns out to be um, uh, sensitive to it. Okay? Now let's uh, learn some interconversion calculations here. Let's suppose that someone is in the dentist's office and the dentist x-rays their teeth and while the dentist is looking at the, their x-ray 
uh, the, the person listens to the FM radio, trying not to think about the drill, uh, and looks out the window at the blue sky. Uh, and for x-rays, the wavelength is one angstrom, after a famous physicist. For the FM radio station that he or she were listening to, it's 325 centimeters. Uh, an angstrom is 10 to the minus 10 meters. So 1 times 10 to the minus 10 meters here. And uh, the um, blue sky, blue is around 470 nanometers. So um, that uh, is the conversion we need to make, first of all, angstroms to um, the uh, frequency, angstroms to meters, meters to frequency. So we're going to do something that looks like this. Two steps. First of all, wavelength in whatever form we got it to wavelength in meters. You have to do that step first because the second step requires you to use the C is equal to lambda nu equation and C is meters per second. So you've got to have the wavelength in meters. So the steps for x-ray, we take one angstrom times 10 to the minus 10 meters per angstrom and we get, not surprisingly, 1 times 10 to the minus 10 meters for the x-ray. So that's the first step. Then we're going to solve uh, the c is equal to lambda nu for nu. So nu will be equal to c over lambda. And uh, c is 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. Lambda is 1 times 10 to the minus 10 meters. Plug it into the calculator. You end up with 3 times 10 to the 18th seconds to the minus 1 for x-radiation. Questions on that one? Very important to use units. Goes without saying. Okay, if you're comfortable with that, let's look at the FM radio. We'll just combine the steps here now. Nu is equal to C over lambda. Again, C is this number, and we need to convert 325 centimeters uh, to meters. Uh, there are 10 to the minus 2 meters per centimeter, or 1 meter over 100 centimeters, whichever you like, gives 9.23 times 10 to the 7 hertz. 1 hertz is equal to 1 cycle per second, or 1 per second. And then in the sky, we'll do the same thing. 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second, divided by 473 nanometers. A nanometer is 1 uh, billionth of a meter, so it's 10 to the minus 9th meters over uh, 1 nanometer, and uh, the nanometers cancel out. We get 6 times 10 to the 14th second uh, to the minus 1 for blue light. Questions on any of those? You'll see this on the Chapter 7 homework, which um, will open on Sunday and stay open for two weeks. Okay. Now, we've talked about Budweiser radiation, neon lights, neon lamps of one kind or another, but that's not the only kind of radiation that we have. And what I want to do here is to talk about heat radiation because it played a key role in the development of the quantum theory. Now, if you have an electrical stovetop, how many people have electrical stovetop? Okay, when you turn on the unit, you want to boil some water to make some spaghetti, some pasta. Uh, you see that as the unit heats up, you begin to see a kind of an orange color uh, of the, uh, the unit appears orange, and you can feel the heat coming off of it. That is heat radiation, uh, and uh, it is known quite well to all of us that if you put your hand on something that's glowing red hot, uh, it's not going to do your hand any good. Uh, and in fact, every, every body, every object that is above absolute zero emits some amount of infrared radiation. If you want to see in the dark, you could take advantage of that using glasses that uh, change the frequency of the light that they receive. These uh, night goggles, okay? You've all seen them, I'm sure, in 
movies and television programs and so forth. What they do is they, they have a, um, a device which changes the frequency or the wavelength. It just, it has, it's called a doubler. And it adjusts it, whatever the infrared is, so that the wavelength becomes uh, converted to the visible region. Now, here's a piece of, um, this is a copper rod, and to demonstrate heat radiation, let me show you what happens when it's heated with a torch. A metal bar, like all objects at room temperature, emits infrared radiation. When heated to a relatively low temperature, however, the emitted radiation is in the red portion of the visible spectrum. As temperature increases, more light of shorter wavelengths is emitted until the bar glows white hot. In general, the hotter an object, the shorter the wavelength of light it emits. As the bar cools down, its glow returns to red. I hope you could hear that. The sound was not too good. Uh, but generally speaking, the uh, wavelength of the light produced by a heated body uh, is a function of the temperature and the amplitude or the intensity of the light is too. This was known a long time ago. Uh, and measurements uh, of the qualities of this heat radiation produced a problem. And the problem was that Maxwell's electromagnetic theory where he talked about how uh, uh, electromagnetic radiation is produced and how it's described and so forth, it just failed. It was no good at all. They had to throw it out. Uh, it did not describe these, this heat radiation. This is sometimes called black body radiation, incidentally, uh, meaning that it's not reflected light. It's light produced by heated matter. All right. So here was a problem. Uh, and various people talked about it. Uh, the person who made the most uh, notable contribution to it, its name was Max Planck, German physicist. And Planck had the idea, along with a bunch of other people, that the radiation from heated matter owed its existence to the fact that the atoms in the heated matter jiggled. And the higher the temperature you heated them to, the faster they jiggled. And as they jiggled, they emitted radiation. It's uh, basically taking the atoms up to a slightly higher energy state and then having them come back down. And they emitted infrared radiation from that. OK, well, that's not too hard to buy. Sounds reasonable. I hope. Uh, and what he said was, if we've got a heated copper rod here, the light that comes off is uh, controlled by this process uh, that is ultimately due to the atoms. And he proposed that hot solids can emit energy, but the only way he could get his model to add up correctly to the observed quality qualities of this heat radiation. The only way he could do it is if he assumed that the radiation that came off, the electromagnetic radiation that came off, did so in discrete quantities, meaning not continuously. And from this, uh, the idea emerged that if the radiation comes off in discrete chunks, that probably means that the uh, energy change that's occurring in the solid takes place in such a way that a given amount of energy is produced, but not 10% more than that. Right? It's, hard to, it's hard to try to make this clear, but what he said was as follows. The energy that's produced from a hot solid can be described using this equation where nu is the frequency of the heat radiation. H is a constant called Planck's constant, and N is just an ener positive energy. Okay, so the energy is in joules, the uh, frequency is in hertz, 
Uh, H is Planck's constant, which is one of the constants on your periodic table constant sheet. And uh, N is just a positive energy. So the possible energy things you could get would be some basic unit, which is H times nu, and then twice that, then three times that, and so forth. Not 2.5, though, or 1.1. OK. So what Planck said was if solids en emit energy only in fixed amounts, then the only reason that makes sense for that is if atoms also emit energy only in fixed amounts, the atoms that make up the solid. And he uh, expressed it mathematically this way. If an atom changes its energy level, the amount of change is equal to delta E of the atom. And that then will be delta N H nu, where delta N would be the final N minus the initial N. Okay? Uh, now, most of the time, delta N would be 1, it turns out. In other words, it would be the atom in the next highest state coming down to the state just below. And if that were the case, then delta E of the atom would be equal to Planck's constant times nu of the radiation. This is called Planck's equation. And um, keep in mind that uh, H nu of the radiation is also equal to E of the radiation. So delta E of the atom equals uh, E of the radiation is equal to H nu of the radiation. Okay, so the energy of atoms then was, it was decided, must not be continuous. Atoms must only be able to exist in certain fixed states, all right? And if that were the case, and you put some heat into an atom, if you put enough heat into it, maybe it could go up to the next state, all right? And then when you took your source of heat away, maybe it would come back down. And if it did that, some heat radiation might come out, depending on what the atom was and what it was in. A lot of this has to do with the fact that these atoms now are solid atoms, and they exist in a fixed lattice uh, where they are bonded to all of the atoms around them. This is not like a free atom. So each change in a particular atom's energy results in a packet of energy being lost or gained by the atom. If the energy is lost, then it, is, uh, it originates uh, some electromagnetic radiation. And uh, if it's gained, then it has to uh, have energy offered it from someone. Is Anyhow, they're yes? They're not, they're not still connected to each other, or they are? They are connected to one another. In solids, they are. In neon signs, they're not. But in solids, they are. And that complicates things, and that's the reason we won't go much further into this, other than recognizing that the only way that heat radiation could behave the way it's observed to behave is if the energy that causes it, in other words, the, the source of its energy, uh, is uh, something that can exist only in fixed, discrete states. Okay, so the energy packet uh, eventually was called a quantum, meaning a little chunk, a very small chunk. And Planck's relationship then could be stated as delta E of the atom equals E of the quantum, and uh, uh, if we look about the E of the quantum would be the energy change of the atom, and it would also be the energy of the radiation. So delta E of the atom would be E of the radiation, and that would be by Planck's constant equal to H times nu of the radiation. Okay, now I want to hasten to point out to you that what I have written down here for you uh, is, um, uh, it represents magnitudes, <coughs> but I have not assigned particular plus and minus signs. We'll do that later. But the magnitudes have to be equal. That is to say that the atom changes, the ener changes its energy a certain amount. That amount is called the quantum energy, and it shows up if this uh, energy is lost as 
a quantum of radiation. Now, these quanta radiation, not considering signs, sorry, uh, are the basic unit of electromagnetic radiation, essentially like the, an atom is a basic unit of an element. Okay? Well, okay. Uh, Planck put this up on the flagpole, and a few people saluted, but most people said, well, maybe. We don't know for sure. So the next thing that came along was a photoelectric effect. And the photoelectric effect um, was uh, done by a number of physicists and explained by this guy over here. I think you know who that is. Uh, the photoelectric effect uses this apparatus. It uses a piece of metal, and only certain metals will work. Cesium happened to be one that works pretty well. A plate of that was put inside of a glass envelope, and the air was removed from the envelope. Then a metal anode over here, which could be almost any metal, doesn't matter, iron works fine, was placed in there as well, and the two of them were connected in an external circuit. There's a battery and an ammeter to check to see if any um, uh, electrons are flowing through the circuit, or anything's flowing through, through the circuit. So uh, the plate which is called a photoemissive cathode, is hooked to the negative side of the battery. The anode here is connected to the positive side of the battery. And when the right light was shined on this apparatus, electrons began to appear in the circuit. And they, they begin immediately. As soon as the right light is shined on this thing, the ammeter pops up right away and says, there's a current, there's a current. Okay? And if you turn the light off, the current disappears. And when I was a kid, this was called an electric eye. And the grocer down the street from where I lived eventually got one of these that would open up the door for the people coming to his grocery. My cronies and I thought that was a cool thing. And... We spent a lot of time walking through it and seeing the door open and then getting out of the way and then running because he was going to come out with a broom uh, and take care of us for messing with his electric eye. Well, nobody could explain this uh, because it violates, because of some of the details, um, the expected classical physics behavior here. So what I want to do is I want to point out to you the essential features and then talk to you about how Einstein analyzed this in the three minutes I have left. Light striking a photoemitter cathode can cause, if it's the right light, the emission of electrons. The electrons go across. This little anode has a positive sign, so it attracts the negative sign on the electrode, and all of a sudden there's a current. Uh, this could be used to open the door in the grocery store. Uh, the ejected electrons are responsible for the current and uh, they will be produced when the right kind of light is uh, uh, shown on this electric eye. Now here's where Einstein described this thing. This is the, a plot of the current flowing versus the frequency of the light produced. Well, uh, at frequencies below a certain threshold, there was no light produced, no electrons produced, no, no current flow produced. Uh, this is the frequency of the light, and uh, uh, the current flow didn't occur until we got up to a certain threshold frequency. That depended on what metal we used for the, ca the uh, cathode. Different metals had different frequencies. But couple things are important for you to take with you today. One is that uh, no matter how bright the light that was shown on the electric eye, if its frequency was too low, no electrons were produced. And you couldn't sit there and shine it a long time and wait for it to build up and have an electric current. 
wouldn't matter. You could shine the brightest light available on it for the longest time you wanted to, be no current, unless the frequency of the light was at the threshold. Then, once you get light to the right threshold, immediately current begins to flow. There is no waiting time. It doesn't have to build up anything. It doesn't matter if you shine a dim light. Some current will go immediately. Okay, so Einstein looked at this and agreed that classical physics could not explain this, the existence of this threshold. Classical physics, uh, as I understand the analysis of it, said, okay, any light will do as long as you shine it long enough. Eventually you'll get some. Uh, didn't work that way. The wave theory of light said in dim light a time lag would occur. That was not what happened. Uh, Einstein said, let's apply Planck's quantum idea to light. The electromagnetic energy transfers in packets. That's what we said before, right? Uh, the source of the electromagnetic energy now is external. And it comes in to the photoemissive cathode and it transfers energy into the cathode in chunks. And if those chunks are large enough to pull into that metal and pull an electron out, whatever energy it costs to do that, then the current will begin to flow immediately. But if they're not, the electron never makes it out of the atom. It goes back, goes back down. Maybe produces heat. I'm not sure what it does. But it doesn't make it out. So um, the idea was that light must come in little chunks. And these chunks were called photons. And the energy of one of these chunks, guess what, was given by Planck's constant times nu of the photon. A problem that has to do with the energy of photons and how it relates to frequency and wavelength. And this has to do with photons of violet light. Uh, if we look at the relationship between photons and electromagnetic radiation as being something parallel to electrons and atoms, uh, or maybe there's a better analogy. Uh, the photon has particle properties under some circumstances. It interacts with matter as if it had a fixed energy um, content, if you will. Okay, so we can describe the energy of photons in terms of either the frequency, in which case the energy of the photon is equal to h times nu, the frequency, or the wavelength, and in that case, e the photon is equal to h c over lambda of the, of the photon. So we can calculate the energy either given the frequency or given the wavelength. Right, so what is the energy of a photon, a violet light, that has a frequency of 6.15 times 10 to the 14th hertz, given that Planck's constant h is 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34 joule seconds? Okay, um, so we're given the frequency, so we're going to use this part of the energy of photon equation, and we're going to start off with Planck's constant, 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34 joule seconds, joule dot second. That's one of the constants on your periodic table and constant sheet. And we're going to multiply that by the frequency, which is 6.15 times 10 to the 14th hertz. And that's a hertz is reciprocal second, so that's second to the minus 1. Second of the minus one times second will cancel out. The answer will be in joules. And the number that I got was 4.08 times 10 to the negative 19th joules per photon. Questions on that? OK. Uh, if we're given the wavelength, then we have to use the slightly more complicated equation E the photon is equal to Planck's constant times the speed of light divided by the wavelength of the photon, and this has to be in meters. 
So um, I have put down here a problem. It says a star emits radio frequency radiation with a wavelength of 12 centimeters. What is its photon energy? Now, the photon energy in joules at this point is equal to H, Planck's constant in joule seconds, times C in meters per second, divided by lambda in meters. That will give the answer in joules. And um, uh, we have to first get lambda in meters uh, instead of centimeters. So uh, lambda in meters is equal to uh, 12 centimeters times 1 meter over 10 to the second 10 squared centimeters. And so that is 0 0.12 meters. Then E of the photon is equal to Planck's constant, 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34 joule dot seconds times 3.00 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, the speed of electromagnetic radiation uh, propagation, meters per second. And now we're going to divide that by lambda in meters, uh, which is 0 0.12 meters. And when I carried out the math, I got 1.66 times 10 to the minus 24 joules. So radio frequency radiation has photon energies which are much less than visible light. 